Hi, welcome to the Loma Center. Come right on in. Well, welcome to the Loma Center. We're a non-for-profit museum operated by the Lomas and Somme Foundation here in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. This main bay is our welcome area. To your right will be the George Woodbridge collection. George Woodbridge was a historic illustrator. He had a passion for American military uniforms. He was the Dean of American Military Uniform Artists. This collection is part of his portfolio. And down just a little ways further is the collection that he specifically drew for American Arms and Equipage, which was a three volume set published by the Company of Military Historians. All of those artworks are layout images that would eventually be printed in that three volume set. All the artillery in the museum is original to the Civil War. Off to our right is the Armory Collection, which covers the American history of martial firearms from the French and Indian War up to the Vietnam War. In the rear of this bay is our original shell collection. And in our conference area, we have all of our displays in there are dedicated to how art interprets the phenomenon of warfare. And we have a temporary exhibit there this weekend about the United States armored divisions in World War II during Operation Cobra, which was the breakout from the Normandy beachheads that basically liberated Southern France and would help us on our way to Paris. So this is our armory collection. It starts here before our nation was even its own nation, back when we were, we were colonies. It starts in the French and Indian War prior to. French and Indian War would help decide who was going to control the majority of North America. Some of the weapons that are unique in this case specifically, if you want to get down to the very first muskets manufactured here in the United States. During the French and Indian War, during the Revolutionary War, we didn't make firearms here in the United States except for civilian weapons. Military firearms came from the British, the French. The French would give us a lot of muskets during the American Revolution. Our first US made musket in our history as a nation would be based off of the French Charlevilles that the French gave us during our revolution. We would copy those weapons and they would become the 1795 musket, model of 1795. In 1794, our newly founded Congress would enact legislation that created two federal armories, the first being Springfield and the second being Harper's Ferry. Those two federal army, armies were, or excuse me, armories were supposed to create all of the muskets for the federal army, our regular army. All of the militia muskets, so what would become our National Guard today, they were supposed to have weapons made by contractors. So if you were in the Pennsylvania militia, you would have a musket made by a private contractor in the state of Pennsylvania. And that's what this weapon is. This WNNS Philadelphia Model 1795 is a musket based off the federal 1795 pattern, but was made by a private firearms manufacturer in Philadelphia. This would be a Pennsylvania militia musket. Some of the notable features that show its lineage coming from French muskets are the use of barrel bands. The British used pins, kind of like this reproduction brown bess. If you look carefully, there's pins holding the barrel into the stock. If you've heard the term lock, stock, and barrel, that's where the term comes from. It means you have everything. So this would be your lock. The wood part is, of course, your stock and the barrel is your large metal barrel. The British would pin their barrels into the stocks. The French used these metal bands. This is a tradition that we will take on in the 1795 because it's the musket we're making, which is basically a copy of the Charleville, but that tradition will carry on in American military firearms all the way into the 1903 Springfield of World War I, which still used barrel bands to hold the barrel to the stock. This case shows the progression of firearms technology, leaving the flint lock behind, which was a tried and true ignition system, uses flint striking a metal frizzen, producing sparks, igniting the gunpowder and firing the gun. Towards the early 1800s, percussion was becoming a, pr a prominent technology for ignition. It uses force and a chemical called fulcrumate of mercury, which when struck works just like a cap in a cap gun. When, it, when it's hit with enough pressure, it ignites, produces spark. That's the initial charge that will discharge the firearm. Percussion will take over as our predominant ignition system by the American Civil War. Some of these are examples of conversions. 
Muskets are expensive to make. All firearms are expensive to make. So most countries tried to convert the weapons they had at the time to take on the new technology. So this is actually a War of 1812 rifle. It's the Harper's Ferry rifle. It was designed for rifle regiments for the United States military during the War of 1812. They'd be utilized during that war when we were fighting Britain for the second time. This one was converted after the War of 1812 to use the new percussion lock instead of its original flintlock configuration. There's two primary types of percussion conversion. There's drum conversion, where you take the old vent from the flintlock, thread it, and put a drum on it so we can use percussion caps. This is a drum conversion example here. And then we also have in-barrel conversion. In-barrel means that the old vent is filled with this piece of metal, and the, the barrel is actually drilled towards the center of it to put a new percussion cap um, to put the new percussion cap system in. So in barrel, drum conversion. These are some import muskets that would have come into the country uh, towards the 1840s from all over the place. There are Belgian muskets, French muskets. Lots of these weapons would see service in the Civil War, uh, specifically with the Confederacy, but certainly uh, with the Union troops as well. We couldn't produce enough guns. We just could not make enough guns for the American Civil War, so we would import a lot of them. And these are some of the less notable imports that were still here during, uh, during the Civil War. The entire back wall of our armory is dedicated to the firearms that truly fought the American Civil War. This is what you would have seen here at the Battle of Gettysburg and would have been a co common weapons all across the battlefields of the United States during the American Civil War. One of my favorites is our Springfield Model 1842 musket. I call it our first and last musket. It is the last musket to be issued generally to the United States military that was smooth bore. But it's our first as well, because it's the first weapon out of all of the others that we have on display on this side of the armory that used interchangeable parts. You can take a couple of these muskets apart, mix the parts around, and it'll still be able to be reassembled and fire. So that was a new change. It's actually what gave birth to, the, uh, to what we would consider today as a modern MOS of armor. If you can't change parts and you had to be a gunsmith, that's not possible with all of these other weapons that don't have interchangeable parts. Once you do have interchangeable parts, you're able to take a few of them. You can replace parts. You can change out things. There can be field repairs made to them. In the next case, we have an interesting example of a British brown best that has been converted to percussion, right? Would have been a common um, weapon. Um, in the British military in the 1840s, some of them would have been imported because they would have been very inexpensive at the time. It's still a smoothbore. Now, going back to the 1842 musket, it was our last smoothbore musket issued generally to the United States military. Not very long after that, a new development, not rifling. Rifles had always been around. You had rifles in the War of 1812, French and Indian War, Revolution, earlier time periods, new rifles. But the problem was you couldn't generally issue them, primarily because of rifling. Rifling, the best way to describe it is that it puts a spin on the projectile, increasing accuracy. But in order, while you're firing a round lead projectile, to make that spin happen as it leaves the barrel, that lead round ball has to engage the rifling the entire way down the barrel, which makes them very slow to load. A typical rate of fire in even as early as the French and Indian War, three rounds a minute would be considered ideal. That speed could not be obtained with rifled uh, muskets of the time period because they're using a round projectile, has to engage the grooves. You have to use what's called a ball starter because it's very hard to initially start the round down the barrel. So you're not getting that three rounds a minute. So most countries, including the United States, opted for a higher rate of fire over the increased accuracy of a rifle. Smoothbore muskets, there's no rifling, it's just a, a smooth tube the whole way down. You can very easily push a projectile down that barrel. So what comes out towards the end of the production of the 1842 Springfield is that a gentleman by the name of Claude Minier develops the Minier ball, which we will Americanize as the mini ball. It's a conical round, it has a depression in the back, what it does is that allows the round to be slightly smaller than the diameter of the barrel, making it easier to push down the whole way and seat the round inside the musket. That will now make it possible to generally issue rifled muskets, so increased accuracy, but maintain that higher rate of fire of three rounds a minute. The way that's achieved is because it's smaller at the beginning, push it all the way down, that depression in the now pointed conical round, when the gases from the burning powder of the charge they burn, they expand the lead round and fill that 
depression in the back of that round with gases. It expands it, you get the rifle gripping, you get that spin on the projectile and the accuracy, but now you maintain the rate of fire. So the 1842 will be quickly converted to, from the 1842 smoothbore musket to the 1842 rifle musket. And the main difference is that they had to add a sight and they put a new barrel on it that had the rifling in it. The 1842 will see service throughout the Civil War, but newer models will become available as well. The next one we really need to talk about in the progression of Springfields is the 1855 Springfield rifle musket. It's rifled uses that conical mini ball projectile. It has the good rate of fire. They attempted to now, now you have a generally issued rifle, they attempted to increase the rate of fire further by using an automatic or mechanical priming system. Instead of having to take a cap and place it on the, um, on the firing cone each time, they tried to use rolled papered caps and that's actually what was called the Maynard priming system. It was an attempt. Every time you pulled the hammer back, it would feed a new cap into position. It, it sounded great on paper. In theory, it was a great way to speed up the rate of fire. In practice, it didn't work. It was a failure. So the 1855 will be issued, used during the Civil War, but the Maynard priming system will not be greatly used to any kind of effect during the Civil War. You'll just go back to a traditional priming uh, cap that you have to put on each time you want to fire. The Maynard system goes away, and that gives rise to the 1861 Springfield, which is, again, made at Springfield and Harper's Ferry. And in fact, when Stonewall Jackson captures the Harper's Ferry Armory, the 1861 Springfield, all the equipment to make those at Harper's Ferry will be sent to Richmond, and that'll become the Confederate 61 Richmond. They're identical uh, in design. They use some different materials, but primarily it was made possible by Stonewall Jackson capturing Harper's Ferry, which was a federal armory. We have to work our way back a little bit because though all these Springfields are made here in the United States, we still had to import weapons because we still couldn't make enough firearms. So one of the most common imported muskets was the 1853 Enfield. The British had used the Enfield in the Crimean War. They had tons of them surplus following that war. The British were more than happy to sell both the United States and the Confederate States large quantities of 1853 Enfields. So that would be the other most common rifled musket on the battlefield on both sides. Another unique Confederate specific weapon would be this Whitneyville Model 1863 Springfield. It was manufactured by the Springfield Armory, but it would be captured on the battlefield and collected by the Confederates and marked with a seven. That means that it's a captured weapon that would be reissued to the Confederates. So that is a true Confederate 1861 Springfield because it's marked with the seven. As we turn the corner in our armory, we begin to uh, turn the century as well as far as firearms technology goes. The Colt Special Contract Muskets, Colt made a lot of muskets for the United States military. They were a contract company that manufactured them. They made some of their own design changes to the Springfield 61 design. And so these weapons were made between 61 and 65 as well. When we get to the bottom of this case, we're looking at a number of different conversions. All of the weapons we've looked, up, looked at up to this point are muzzle loading muskets. That means you have to load them from the front, right? You load them from the muzzle. The Civil War was actually one of the first conflicts in American history that proved that the future was going to be metallic cartridges and breech loading weapons. No more tearing paper cartridges and loading them from the front. So some of these are examples of early attempts at making breech loading muskets. However, it won't be until the 1870s, early eight, uh, late 1860s, early 1870s, that a true design that would be accepted by the United States military would be um, approved and the conversion process would begin. Just like when percussion technology became available, again, you couldn't get rid of all of the muskets that were of the old design. We had just fought the American Civil War, had tons of 1861 Springfields around. We needed to convert those muskets to utilize the new metallic cartridge technology. A gentleman by the name of Allen at the Springfield Armory comes up with a solution. We can take 1861 Springfields that had just fought the American Civil War and convert them to utilize the new metallic cartridge technology. So this is a true Allen conversion. There were a number of design uh, changes that occurred. This one was manufactured in 1865. It is the Trapdoor Springfield, and it's one of the first versions of the Trapdoor Springfield that we'll use throughout the Plains Wars and into the beginning of the Spanish-American War for National Guard units. Each one of these is an example of a trapdoor Springfield. 
all manufactured at different times. Again, a number of design changes happened with each one. Originally, those Civil War muskets were converted. By the 1880s, we've used up all of the surplus Civil War muskets for conversion, and we start manufacturing new purpose-built trapdoors. And that's where you see a lot of design changes in the weapon. They change the sights. They play with the, the bayonet design. In fact, this 1888 model didn't use a socket bayonet like the, they had used in all previous models and we had used during the American Civil War. This one was an attempt to utilize the cleaning rod because if it's a breech loader, you're no longer using the ramrod uh, to load the weapon. It's actually used as the cleaning rod and if you have a, um, a ruptured case that needs to be forced out of the chamber, so they would replace all of the ramrods or cleaning rods with a rod bayonet. This extends out, it's a spherical bayonet, or excuse me, a cylindrical bayonet. The, it's a rod bayonet, and it will also act as your cleaning rod. It wasn't a very well accepted design. Teddy Roosevelt said it was the silliest bayonet he had ever seen, but it was another attempt. We'll use a bunch of 1888 uh, trapdoors as well as earlier models during the Spanish-American War. Couple of examples of National Guard guns here from the Plains Wars and some um, still in use by the uh, United States militias and National Guard units um, during the Spanish-American War are the rolling blocks. They were designed by Remington. Still single round, have to reload in between each, each round, but a different design. Rather than the trapdoor, it has a rolling block. It was Remington's design. Chaffee and Reese Springfield rifle is an attempt at a bolt action rifle. Use, it was chambered in 4570. This time, instead of a trap door or even a rolling block, you work a bolt to load from the breech of the weapon. Um, never accepted into uh, mass production or general issue. In fact, it won't be until the 1890s that the United States receives its first generally mass issued uh, bolt action rifle, and that is the model 1898 Crag rifle. The Crag is what we would use in the Spanish-American War alongside um, trapdoor springfields and a few rolling blocks. The Crag goes through the same evolution as the trapdoors. Keep changing the sights, keep playing with the design slightly. The Crag was an excellent weapon, but its fate was pretty much sealed because no sooner do we accept the Crag rifle as we're already designing the new 1903 Springfield, which will be accepted and begin being issued um, in 1903 and will be one of the weapons we fight World War I with. However, the Krag still lives on during World War I as a training rifle. Lots and lots of Krags were utilized by U.S. troops during the buildup in 1917 as training rifles. There weren't any Krags in France. Those were, those were replaced after training with the 1903 Springfield if we had them. The number one weapon used by U.S. troops during World War I was the 1917 Eddie Stone Enfield or the, the uh, P-17 or the M-1917 um, Enfield designed by Remington at the Eddie Stone factory. That is actually the one that Sergeant York used. He did not have a Springfield. He actually had an Eddie Stone um, Enfield. And the reason we had those was the British had asked us to design a weapon to, uh, to either replace or supplement their British Enfield designed uh, short magazine Lee Enfield. That weapon, the P-17 rifle, which was the British design Remington was working on, became the M-17 when we entered the war, and Eddie Stone and Remington Arms was kind enough to make them for the United States military for our use in 30-06, which was our general caliber during, the, uh, during World War I. Another interesting rifle in our collection that is a foreign-made rifle, but it is still U a U.S. rifle. Um, I mentioned that we were using a lot of crags for training. We also purchased 20,000 Ross rifles, which were the Canadian rifle used um, by the Canadian troops in the beginning of World War I. It was their standard issue rifle. It's a straight pull rifle. You pull the bolt action back. You don't have to lift. You pull it back. You push it forward. The bolt does a camming action, and all of the work is done by the mechanics of the bolt. This case is dedicated to our um, carbine collection, so the weapons that were shorter utilized by mount mounted troops. This is the 1865 Spencer. This is the one that started it all for the United States military and the idea that metallic cartridges, not paper ones, were going to be the future. Very successful weapon. It's a repeating rifle. Um, it, the Confederates said of the Spencer that you could load it on Sunday and shoot it all week because it has a seven round tubular magazine through the back of the buttstock. Couple of other examples of generally common issued um, carbines during the Civil War, the Burnside, the Smith, and then again, 
following the progression of weapons technology. These are not Civil War carbines or carbines, but they're rolling. The rolling block is the shorter version of the Remington rolling block that we see uh, used during the Plains Wars and in the, into part of the Spanish-American War. And then these are trapdoor Springfield carbines, so just shorter models of the trapdoor. Our last case takes us into the modern era of firearms, what we consider the modern era, World War I, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. This is a 1903 Springfield manufactured in World War I. It is not in its World War I configuration any longer. In the 1930s, we took all of the World War I rifles, or a majority of them, and converted them to the new stock configuration that we wanted for the 1903 Springfield. Lots of Springfields would be used in World War II, some of them surplus from World War I that had been rebuilt like this one um, following World War I at an arsenal. Remington, specifically Remington and a couple of other contractors made the 1903 A3, which was only produced during World War II, designed to be a rear echelon rifle and also a training rifle during World War II. The M1 carbine, it was the carbine version of the M1 Garand. It doesn't use the exact same operating system, but it was designed for troops uh, serving on crew weapons, drivers, anybody that didn't need the M1 rifle but needed a weapon that they could defend themselves with but was in a smaller package. Very popular weapon throughout World War II and Korea. In Vietnam, we'll give them to the South Vietnamese along with the full auto version, which is the M2 carbine, which would see use in Korea, and then we would give a lot of them to the South Vietnamese during the Vietnam War. The M1 Garand, designed by, at Springfield Armory by John C. Garand, he uh, designed one of the first successful, generally issued semi-automatic rifles. Patton said that the M1 Garand was the greatest battlefield uh, implement ever devised. We will use this weapon with excellent service records. Um, we'll use this weapon throughout World War II. It gave us the advantages most of our troops were armed with a semi-automatic weapon, as opposed to our adversaries still having bolt-action weapons. Higher rate of fire, very accurate and very reliable weapon, well loved by just about everybody that carried one. Um, we'll use it in World War II and Korea. Again, this weapon will be given to the South Vietnamese during the Vietnam War. The M1 Garand gets a little bit of an update with the M14 rifle in the late 1950s. The M14 changes its operating system slightly, and also gives it a 20 round detachable box magazine. The other addition is the option for full auto fire. The M1 Garand only fired in semi-automatic. The M14 is capable of firing in semi and full auto fire. Um, the weapon would be generally issued to the United States military. It would see service in the beginning of the Vietnam War. It would continue all throughout um, our time in Vietnam as a weapon that was available, but not generally issued. It would generally be replaced by the M16, which was originally contracted by the United States Air Force through Colt. Eugene Stoner would design its principle of operation. The weapon would see most of its service either as the M16 with the Air Force or the M16A1, which we became the predominant version of the M16 during the Vietnam War, both with the United States Marine Corps and the United States Army. And we're still using a variant of the M16 to this day, or at least until they adopt a new rifle, which we have a, a number of them um, being looked at by the uh, United States military as an option for replacement of the M16 platform. Um, hopefully in the near future, possibly, um, possibly depending on who's, uh, whose design concept ends up with the contract, or it may not happen at all. But the M16 has had a very long and successful life once they work the bugs out of it. Well, this is our prized possession. This is gun number one. It is the first three inch ordnance rifle ever accepted by the US Ordnance Department. If you look at the muzzle of this barrel, you'll see that it bears serial number one. It means that it's the absolute first tube that the US military accepted of this variety of gun. Um, it is unique in the fact that during the Civil War, it was the height of its technology. It was the one of the first successful rifled artillery pieces. Again, just like the muskets, most cannons were smoothbore. Rifling adds accuracy to the weapon. One of the major problems with a rifled gun was that the metal that the weapon was made out of had to be strong enough to withstand the friction caused by rifling, right? Because the round has to has to engage the rifling, which increases the friction. Most artillery pieces during the Civil War and prior, um, one of the go-to materials was bronze. Bronze is too soft for rifling, so you have to use iron. 
Iron led to a number of problems in the fact that during the casting process, iron is not as forgiving when there's an imperfection. In fact, a lot of iron guns were prone to exploding. Um, that was the problem, but they wanted a rifled gun that would be safe. A gentleman by the name of John Griffin came up with a proprietary design to safely manufacture rifled guns made out of iron. His original concept was to utilize a roller mill, creating increased um, increasing, increasing levels of pressure uh, throughout the process and basically welding individual rods of wrought iron together to make the tube. Um, all of this process was done at Phoenixville Iron Com or Phoenix Iron Company in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. This weapon um, would become the production model known as the three-inch ordnance rifle, but Griffin's original design would be the Griffin gun. They made about 18 of them in total, kind of as a proof of concept. We would never use the Griffin gun during the American Civil War. In fact, all 18 of those tubes would be sold to the British for use during the Crimean War, but it proved that the concept was successful. Another gentleman at Phoenix Iron Company by the name of Reeves would adapt Griffin's original design to improve upon it. There were some problems still with the production. Um, there, they decided that instead of using individual ingots of wrought iron, what if you used a continuous flat sheet of wrought iron? And that, that change in the patent, that change in the process, would give birth to the three-inch ordnance rifle, of which this is the very first to be accepted by the U.S. Ordnance Department. Um, in addition to being the height of its technology at its time, the, in addition to being the first tube accepted, this gun is one of two here in Gettysburg that is documented to have fought at this battle. The, um, one is up at the Buford Monument, and then this one here. This one was with the 1st New York Light Artillery during the Battle of Gettysburg. They had fought all through the beginning of the Civil War using this, this tube and a number of others. They were stationed on the Chambersburg Pike, just in front of the Lutheran Seminary. And on July 1st of 1863, around 3.30 in the afternoon, this gun would be firing at AP Hill's Corps, advancing down the Chambersburg Pike. And it would subsequently be captured by AP Hill's Corps um, on the 1st, and it would become a Confederate gun. This gun would stay in Confederate hands and serve with the Confederacy until 1864, when it was recaptured by Union troops at the Battle of Spotsylvania. So it's unique in the fact that it is the first. It's unique in the fact that we have the provenance of the gun. We know generally where it served. One of the things we're working on filling in now is its service during, the, um, during its time in Confederate hands. And we're looking for outreach from any collector or historian that might know of Confederate documentation for its service during the Battle um, of Gettysburg after it was captured, or all of the time that it was with the Confederates leading up to Spotsylvania. We'd like to finish the story of this tube. So if anyone has any information, please reach out to us. We'd love to see whatever documentation you might have because we want to complete the story. We have a good chunk of it, but we'd like to have the whole story if we could find it. So this is another one of our original Civil War artillery pieces. This is a Model 1841, six pound Napoleon. The barrel is bronze. This one was specifically cast in 1861 in Boston, and uh, it is a smoothbore weapon. So this is an example of a smoothbore weapon. It's made out of bronze, which is really what adds to the importance of the three inch ordnance rifle. That was what they were trying to work on. Bronze is an excellent material for artillery, and it's very easy to work with in casting. So this is a smoothbore weapon. This would have been more for short range work, but it still has a very acceptable, effective range. So the six pound, and then there was also a 12 pound Napoleon, again made out of bronze, but this one is tube number 201 from Boston, and it was cast in 1861. Another 1841 model artillery piece is the 1841 Mountain Howitzer. This is a short range artillery. It was uh, designed to be disassembled, packed on a couple of mules, taken over rough terrain, put back together and into service. So it was kind of an all terrain artillery piece. That's why it's smaller. Um, this would have been, um, these guns would have been used for infantry support. And again, in terrain that was difficult to get over. Um, this one is unique in the fact that it is tube number nine of the first contract for mountain howitzers that the Ames Foundry in Chicopee, Massachusetts ever received. So this is tube number nine of that contract, and it was, um, it was cast by Ames uh, during the Civil War. It was part of their first contract uh, for the mountain howitzer. 
The wall here is dedicated to George Woodbridge. Again, we have his portfolio collection, but these are the ones that we have specifically identified as being the original artwork that would go into the three volume set published by company of military historians called American Arms and Equipage. So each one of these shows a different component of uniform or equipment um, utilized by the United States military. George Woodbridge traveled all across the country to private collections to view actual objects and draw them um, so that we would have detailed prints of different types of equipment, how they were constructed, sizes, dimensions, uh, basically a handbook on how to make a reproduction if you wanted to do so. The dress here is an original dress from the Civil War. It came out of a collection in Atlanta, Georgia. It's a wedding dress. And here we have images of George Lomas. He was the founder of Regimental Quartermaster. He was a staple in the reenacting community. And George became interested in Civil War history and reenacting at an early age. He founded Regimental Quartermaster first as a hobby and then as a full-time business later on in his life. But he was always involved in collecting military firearms, uh, pr uh, competitive shooting with historic firearms. Um, and George was also in the United States military. He actually was in the Quartermaster Corps, so he was a regimental quartermaster. But everything in the museum except for the George Woodbridge collection, he cr uh, collected over his lifetime. He started collecting in the 1960s. He was here in Gettysburg in 18 six, or 1963, commemorating the Battle of 1863. So uh, George has been heavily involved and we're very grateful to him for building this incredible collection that he built over his lifetime. Another part of his collection um, that he amassed over his years of collecting is this original artillery shell collection. Basically a good sampling of the type of ordnance flying around uh, Gettysburg in 1863 during the battle. Lots of different examples. Um, the best way to describe artillery is there's a tool for every job and there's a number of different types of ordnance that can be used for different applications. Over here, this area is dedicated to our home front and aftermath um, of the battle. Some ladies items that would have been commonplace in the 1860s and certainly wouldn't, would have been common items that would have been here in town with the folks living here when the battle began. Harper's Weekly was a weekly journal. Uh, for Northerners, it was how the country learned about the war that was going on. For the Confederacy, you didn't have to. It was happening in your backyard typically. But Harper's Weekly documented for the Northern side specifically very important events during the battle. Some of these are specifically about the Battle of Gettysburg. Others are just examples of original, um, original copies of Harper's Weekly. Over here we have the Elliott Burial Map. This one is a 1934 print of the Elliott Burial Map. Of course, it shows where the National Cemetery is and generally where a number of the temporary graves for both Union and Confederate troops were. Of course, when the battle ended, they needed to uh, get the bodies underground because August was coming. And later, they, these bodies would be exhumed from their temporary graves and brought to the National Cemetery, or their bodies would be repatriated back to the state that they came from in the South. So this is our conference area and our interpretive um, installations in here, generally when we don't have a special event going on or a special display like we do this weekend, this room is dedicated to explaining how different types of artwork document and deal with the phenomenon of warfare. Civil, the American Civil War was one of the first wars to be documented here in the United States with photography. So it was very much the birth of photojournalism. Gentlemen like Matthew Brady and Gardner, they documented the war with images um, and that, that's kind of what we explore in this area. This weekend we have a special display uh, commemorating Operation Cobra during World War II. Specifically these are the uniforms, equipment, and weapons of the 2nd Armored Division uh, during Operation Cobra, which was the breakout from the Normandy beachheads and the liberation of southern France, which would subsequently lead to us recapturing Paris. Some examples of equipment, including a World War II tanker helmet, uh, the General M1 steel pot, a mechanics um, apron for tools, an M1 dust respirator. These were designed to help filter the air in vehicle convoys if they were kicking up a lot of dust. Um, this one was actually made in 1942. Some of your colder weather clothing, probably not as popular during Operation Cobra, but would be later on in World War II. A uh, fatigue uniform in HBT, the iconic tanker jacket, a wool sweater, 
Pack boards to carry ammunition. These are 30 caliber ammunition cans and 50 caliber ammo cans. Both would have been on the Sherman tanks and the other types of tanks utilized during Operation Cobra. Some personal effects, a, a, a field stove, your mess kit equipment for preparing your food, some US Army issued books. The United States military made a large effort to try and get books to the troops for their downtime. And they had their own, um, their own uh, printing of books that were specifically designed to work with fitting into um, the pockets of the uniform or to be condensed in size so that they would fit in a pack so you could easily carry your book with you. These are some of the examples of web equipment that would have been utilized. M1 fragmentation grenades, a pair of binoculars, uh, M1 ammo bags, Thompson ammunition bags, canteen, um, canteen pouches for your canteen, musette bags that were popular with the armored troops, basically just a side bag for your personal effects. Um, a BAR ammunition, cart, uh, ammunition belt, an M1 Garand ammunition uh, belt, entrenching tool, wire cutters, a map case to help you navigate um, through uh, the battle area and wherever you were headed. And then these are some of the examples of uh, weapons from World War II. Um, this is an example of a Browning automatic rifle, originally designed by John Browning uh, to be used at the end of World War I. It was the model 1918. It did not get to France in World War I with American troops in large numbers. Some of them did make it to the, uh, to the, in, to the, uh, you know, to the main front trenches towards the end of World War I, but the BAR was designed for World War I, but would actually fight predominantly through World War II and Korea. Uh, this one is in a 1918A2 configuration that would have been common um, to see towards, you know, 43, 44. Two examples of Thompsons. This is a 1928 Thompson, made famous by gangsters, the Chicago typewriter model. Um, of course, this is the military configuration. doesn't have that forward hand grip. It has a more traditional front hand stock instead of the pistol grip that the gangsters would have made famous. And this is the M1A1 Thompson, which is the streamlined production model that would have been very common with military use, both in Europe and the Pacific uh, during World War II. Two examples of M1 Garands, both of them um, pretty commonplace uh, for the time period. Uh, this one has a barrel dated for 1940. This one is actually a rebuild. So just like the one we have in the collection in our armory room, this one was actually rebuilt for reissue in Korea. And then of course the M1 carbine, which we looked at in the case as well. Um, a carryover from the, day, the end days of mounted cavalry on horses is a rifle scabbard. Not always a common item in World War II, but there were some that survived and were strapped to vehicles and Jeeps and those kinds of things. Um, not every Jeep had one of these. In fact, there were already rifle racks on most vehicles. But this was a carryover specifically popular with units that were in armored, armored reconnaissance, which is where most of your cavalry units went to in World War II. So it might have been a, a passionate uh, carryover from the last days of horse-mounted cavalry. And then, of course, some more personal effects, tobacco items, identification cards, and some training manuals. Behind you in the corner is our model 1875 Gatling gun. It is an original 1875 Gatling gun carriage, um, and the Gatling gun itself is a reproduction from the 1930s. It was designed originally by Dr. Gatling, who was a dentist. There were not many Gatling guns, if any, used during the Civil War. The Model 1875 is really the one that proved his design was successful. The original Gatling guns did not utilize metallic cartridges, and the technology had not advanced. The gun's design was far, far more advanced than the ammunition technology of the time. So the Model 1875 proved that Dr. Gatling's design was very good. Our Gatling gun is a 1930s reproduction done by a gentleman in Abbotts, uh, Abbottstown, Pennsylvania, and it was done on original tooling that was um, in the U.S. Ordnance Department um, all the way into World War I. And so this is a very accurate reproduction done in the 1930s because it was done on the original tooling. And it was one of George Lomas's favorites. He competitively shot this Gatling gun, and it is an original carriage, which is impressive. On this wall, we have our collection of George Woodbridge's Marvel Comics. George Woodbridge was a um, uniform artist, a historic uniform artist, but he also worked for Mad Magazine for 40 years and did some illustrations for Marvel Comics. 
These are the original layouts on Marvel comic layout panels that George Woodbridge did for Epic Battles of the Civil War, which was a series that Marvel Comics did, and it covered the bat major battles of the Civil War. This is from Volume 4, which is all about the Battle of Gettysburg. George, George Woodbridge wrote and illustrated this entire volume, and uh, they're all in black and white because George Woodbridge was actually colorblind. All of the coloring was done by somebody else at Marvel. Um, after he did all of the layouts. So we can see the progression. This is almost every page that is in the comic book. Um, they're no longer printed by Marvel. They are now um, printed by a private printing company under license. But these are the original layouts that George Woodbridge drew with, uh, with, ink, and, uh, with ink and some correction fluid. And there's a couple of examples where he changed different things, changed the shading, changed the outline. But you can see here, this is the centerfold of the, of the comic book. This is the original layout done on two layout panels. And here is an example of the reproduction print that is currently available. So you can see that they match up very well, but this is the colorized version. So George Lomas, who helped, co who collected throughout his lifetime the majority of our collection here at the Lomas Center, he was involved in the filming of the movie Gettysburg and Gods and Generals. Uh, George sold a lot of equipment through Regimental Quartermaster for the filming. He was um, on scene when they were uh, filming large portions of the movie Gettysburg. And some of this is some of the memorabilia that he collected during his involvement with the filming of Gettysburg. And of course, these are original examples of posters that would have been advertising um, the Gettysburg film and subsequently Gods and Generals. But uh, there are some photos of George Lomas with some of the major characters in the movie during the filming. And uh, the movie was a great success. Of course, everybody knows the movie um, Gettysburg. And Ron Maxwell actually said that his purpose in making Gettysburg was not so much to document exactly what happened here, because it's based on historic fiction. His purpose was to get people thinking about the Battle of Gettysburg, get them to the battlefield, and have them ask questions. So I definitely think that the movie has successfully done that. Because everybody that comes here to Gettysburg comes to the Loma Center. They know about the movie Gettysburg, have heard about it. And it's usually one of the reasons that they come here to see this place. Thank you very much for visiting us for this short time here at the Loma Center. We look forward to having you here in person. We are right off of Steinware Avenue. We are, on, we are at 50 Mayer Alley. We're right behind the Farnsworth House and just up the hill in a three-bay brick building on Mayer Alley. Um, minutes away from the Farnsworth House, Mr. G's Ice Cream on Steinware Avenue. We look forward to having you. Please come and see our collection, ask questions, and learn a little bit more about the Loma Center, the military history of the United States, and its involvement here in the Battle of Gettysburg and following the Battle of Gettysburg. There's a lot more history in Gettysburg than just the Civil War. We'd love to have the opportunity to share some of that with you and answer some questions you might have.